All right, so I've got just a little after 3.15, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so welcome to all of you, uh, both here and uh, for those of you who are listening in on chat. Uh, my name is Joe Askins. I coordinate instructional services here at Ellis Library. Uh, today, there are going to be five of us, uh, five librarians here myself included, who will be uh, speaking with you today, just kind of introducing you to some of the different services and resources uh, that are available through the University of Missouri Libraries. Uh, what we're going to do today is talk about some of the different aspects of the library, some of the different departments there here, some of the different services that we provide. Uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time walking you through the nitty gritty of like conducting searches and things like that, but we can introduce you to, uh, we'll take a look at, at things like the front page of the library's website, kind of show you where to go to, uh, to get to different services and resources online. And just to kind of explain to you some of the different things that we do here. For those of you who uh, have come here from another institution, if you're a grad student or a postdoc or a uh, new faculty, then some of the stuff that we do here is probably going to be different from what you're used to at your old library. If you are an undergrad and you're here, there's a good chance that some of the things we're talking about today are things that you haven't uh, taking advantage yet, uh, taking advantage of yet, but that you might as you go on, especially if you're going to be conducting research, if you're participating in undergraduate research, things like that. So I'm Joe Haskins, uh, Head of Access Services is Cindy Cotner. She's going to be speaking after me. Kelly Hansen from Special Collections will be after her. Felicity Dykus uh, from Digital Services will be speaking. And then Marie Concan our Head of Government Information uh, will be speaking last. So hopefully we'll be done in about 45 minutes. We'll have some time for any questions that you might have about anything that we've discussed or just any sort of questions that you might have about library services here in general. So um, keep that in mind and hopefully we'll be able to have some time there at the end to answer any questions. There's been a sign-in sheet that's gone around. I think most everybody's gotten that, but uh, if you haven't signed in, either sign in now if it's passed around to you or just make sure you do it at the end. Um, also in the back, we do have some marketing materials uh, that we were getting set out as a lot of you were coming in here. So feel free to go back and browse those. We have business cards for subject librarians. So uh, if you are majoring, if you have a particular major interest area, uh, or if you're going to be uh, teaching in a particular uh, department, let us know and we can find the contact info for your subject library. So. First things first, a lot of what you're going to be doing with uh, with regards to the library, a lot of the information you're going to want, a lot of the stuff that you want to connect with, you're going to find through the library's website. Hopefully, since you were able to register for these workshops, you've been to this website before, but we're going to take a look at it uh, on several occasions throughout this next hour. It's library.missouri.edu. Hopefully, that's pretty easy to remember. You can also Google it. You can search for library on Mizzou's main page. You should be able to get here in lots of different ways. But once you're there, if you haven't already, bookmark this page. The reason that we really encourage people to go through this anytime they're conducting research is because a lot of the electronic resources that we have available are things that you would not be able to access through a simple Google link. Um, you might be able to get to certain databases by Googling them, but if you're not going through the library's website, you're not going to go through a link that has been configured in advance to uh, identify you as somebody affiliated with uh, I won't get into all the technology of how that works, but basically we're going to be able to direct you into these resources in such a way that it, that those resources are going to confirm that you are either a student or faculty member or staff here. So get in the habit of just going there, keep it bookmarked and, uh, and spend some time in your free time if you haven't spent a lot of time there uh, getting used to that website. So I'm just gonna jump over there really quickly. This is what the website looks like. Uh, again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time clicking through a lot of this. Uh, I know some of our other presenters will be showing you different pages on this website. But just to kind of point out some things on the front page of the library's website. Anytime you're curious about when we're open, just pull up the main website. We've got our hours right there. We typically operate on a 24-5 schedule, which means that from Sunday afternoons all the way to Friday evenings, we're pretty much open around the clock. So if you want to come here at 3 in the morning, you can do so. There won't be librarians here to help you with research, but if you come here and you have your student ID or your faculty ID, or I think at this point, as long as you have a picture ID and can provide your student number to security, you'll be able to come in here and use our spaces, use the computers here. You can you know, 
have study rooms. You can have a study space at basically any time you want. And uh, by having that security kind of locking down a little bit more, you can ensure that the people who are in here in this building are just going to be in new students, and faculty, and staff. Right here in the center of the page, this big gray block here with the search field, that's called Discover at MU. Um, depending on what you're looking for, depending on how you're conducting your research, you might want to start with Discover at MU simply because it's sort of a unified search. Uh, it used to be that if you wanted to find books, you had to go and look for books in a catalog. If you wanted to find journal articles in a particular discipline, you had to go know which database to go to. And that database might not be the best one to use if you were searching in another discipline. By using Discover at MU, you can use one single search field to find items from throughout our collection, physical items and digital items, books, ebooks, articles, most of the stuff from our, from our databases, not everything, but you can find most items that we have a record for and that we have access to through that single search. So that's a good way to start, especially early on as a novice uh, researcher. If you're just needing to see what's available on a particular topic, you can use that. Obviously, you can go in and you can search in individual databases uh, as you get more comfortable and more aware of specific databases uh, that are best for particular disciplines. Cindy's going to be talking a little bit about our books and media search. Uh, there are going to be different ways in which you will have access to, uh, to different materials uh, that, uh, that are in our collection or, thing, or, or things that aren't in our collection as well. So we'll be discussing that as well. And then there are certain quick links down here, things like reserving a study room renewing your book, finding subject uh, guides and course guides, and then links that will direct you to specific databases. Or if you have a citation for a particular article and you want to get directly to that article, there are ways that you can do that as well. Also, if there's a particular journal title that you're interested in, you can search to see if we have that journal and see how we have access to it, whether we have it in print or electronically or a mix, which date range we have in print, which date range we have in, uh, electronically and so on. You'll notice that we've got a chat window that'll pop out at you from time to time. You can chat with librarians uh, during most of the daytime hours and, and late afternoon hours. You can chat with a real life librarian who works here in Ellis Library. We try to keep this staffed during the day while librarians are here. So if you have any questions uh, and you need to talk with somebody, a subject librarian who's here or just some sort of specialist who's familiar with our resources, you can always use that. Uh, so you don't have to come into the library if you don't want to. You can jump on there and you can talk with us in real time. So we call ourselves the University of Missouri Libraries because there are actually nine different libraries here on campus that kind of fall under our umbrella. You're in Ellis Library right now. This is our main library. There's also a, Missouri, uh, the, a library at the Columbia Missourian Newsroom. The Missourian is one of the two daily newspapers here in town and we maintain a library there. The engineering school has a library. Geology has a small library. Health sciences has its own library. The journalism school has a library in the, in the RJI building. Uh, there's a math library. We have university archives, which collect records and papers uh, related to the history and operation of uh, the university. And then we have a veterinary medical library. In addition to that, we have offsite depositories. So depending on what types of materials you're wanting to access, there's a chance that we, we might actually store those things offsite. These libraries here on campus aren't growing anytime soon. We've run out of space. Uh, and so we've had to establish off-site storage places where we can quickly access and obtain those materials and bring them back to campus uh, relatively quickly. So we can grab those for you at any time. There would be a slight delay, but, um, but they are there. In addition to that, there are places like the Law Library, which is its own library that operates within the law school here as well. So keep that in mind as well. It's not technically a part of University of Missouri libraries and under that particular like organizational umbrella, but it's also there. So if you're planning on going into law, understand that, that that space is there as well. As I mentioned at the outset, we have different subject librarians here uh, spread out throughout our libraries. I did a quick count a while back just, and I think I counted around 19 different people who have subject specialist responsibilities uh, here within uh, University of Missouri libraries. These are people who uh, whose job it is is to stay in contact, stay in communication with the academic departments here on campus to understand what their research needs are, what their instructional needs are, what their collection needs are. Those are going to be the people that are going to ensure that we maintain a good collection of materials that help support research within all of these different disciplines uh, that are taught and they're researched on campus. 
And then we also provide reference and instructional services. So we will provide research support to faculty and to students. We will also provide instructional services like bringing classes into the library and teaching students how to use uh, and engage with library uh, resources. So these subject librarians are really good to get to know. You can find your subject librarian either by talking to us at the end of the session or by going to library.missouri.edu slash contact us. Or if you're here on the library's main page, if you just look up at the top of the page, there's this directories link. That will take you to a whole list of contacts that we break up and chunk up in all sorts of different ways. If you go to subject librarians, that center tab, this will tell you which librarians are responsible for which subject areas. So if you're majoring in accountancy, Gwen Gray is going to be your librarian. You can find her phone number and her email address. Feel free to reach out to your subject librarian via email anytime you have any questions. Uh, those people are happy to meet with you one on one through uh, research consultations. If you were going to be teaching at all, this is the person who you would work with uh, to deliver information literacy instruction for your class. So feel free to contact those people that way as well. If you're a student, you can schedule consultations with the subject librarian for any class you're enrolled in by going through MU Connect. Hopefully, if you're an undergrad here especially, you should be familiar with, um, uh, with MU Connect at this point. Uh, you can access that in a number of different ways. There should be a little starfish icon in Canvas that you can, that you can go to. And one of the things you can do in MU Connect is you can look at all of your courses that you're enrolled in. And one of the things you will see in there is you will see uh, some little box next to each of your class that says schedule a research consultation appointment with and then it will have that subject librarian's name right there if you click on that link you'll be, you'll be able to see just a short description of who this person is sometimes you might see their photo and then you will see uh, a link that will allow you to contact that person by email if they're providing their phone number you'll see that and then in some cases these people have made their outlook calendars available so you can see when they are available so that you could actually schedule a, con a consultation with that person. You can go and see when they're free and you can book anywhere from like 15 minutes to an hour depending on what they've allowed and then you connect and then that person will get back in touch with you and coordinate a meeting so that you can sit down and discuss what it is that you're working on. I work in instructional services so again if there's anybody here who's going to be doing any teaching here you can contact me or you can contact your subject librarian. We can bring classes into the library. We have classrooms here where we can uh, teach classes uh, about uh, how to use library resources to conduct research uh, so that students can be successful in completing certain assignments uh, and certain projects. And we can tailor that instruction to meet your needs. And then uh, additionally, if at any point any of you would be crafting any sort of assignments for a class, if you're going to be teaching, teaching a class and need to build assignments that might have a research component, you can meet with your subject librarian to discuss ways in which um, in which you might be able to better do that, better integrate library resources uh, sort of as a behind the scenes consultation with us. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Cindy and we just want the main page here. All right, so we're gonna go back to, whoop, to the library's main website and I will hand it off to Cindy Cutler. Thank you, Joe. Yes, I'm Cindy Kotner, and I'm going to talk to you about some traditional library services that we have here. When you think of libraries, you think mostly of books. So I'm going to tell you about the things that you check out of a library, such as books, but there are a lot of other things that, that we check out too. So if you're on the library's homepage that Joe showed you, the part that I want to show you, I'm circling it here, is right here in the middle, in the library, this tab. If you open up this drop-down box, borrow, request, and renew. That's what I want to start with. And there are lots of, lots of things to remember, and you don't have to remember them because um, that's what our staff does. But if you're an undergraduate, if you're a graduate student, if you're faculty, everyone can check out a book for four months. There's no difference if you're an undergraduate or graduate. The difference is how many times you can renew a book. So um, if you want to see what, what kind of services are available for you, we have charts and graphs and all kinds of things. So here in undergraduate, check out four months. You can renew it twice. And here are some other things 
Um, we have equipment. Some things don't check out for four months, and here are some of the different kinds of checkout times. So I don't really expect you to remember all of those. I certainly don't remember all of those, but I just want you to know that we do have this written on our webpage if you want to see that. Um, if you're a graduate student, no, you can, you can renew things um, five times. So if you count that up, four months times five is about two years. So you could theoretically check out books for two years if you're a graduate student. So I um, just wanted to show you that all of these things are, are on our web page, but just kind of give you an idea. Besides books, we have lots of other things that you can check out. We have lots of equipment that, that you can check out. We have things, we have laptops, uh, Mac laptops, Dell computer laptops. We have iPads that check out for three days at a time. We have all kinds of cameras and video recorders and microphones that you can check out. We have projectors. So if you are teaching a class and you need a projector to project on the wall, we have those you can check out. We also have um, whiteboard uh, markers and erasers, so office supply kind of things. We have phone chargers and iPad chargers you can check out. We have calculators, earphones, um, we even have umbrellas. So you can go from one specialized library if it's raining and go to another one, check out an umbrella and turn it back in at the other library if you want to. I have done that before. So I've gotten an overdue notice because I forgot to turn in my umbrella one time. So it's possible to do that. And some of the fun things that we have that check out, some of our specialized library at the engineering, they have ties that you can check out. So if you're going for an interview and if you want a bow tie or if you want a regular traditional tie, they've got all kinds of ties that you can check out at the engineering library. And they even have staff who can show you how to tie your bow tie if you need help with that. And they also have board games there. So just wanted to tell you that besides books, there are lots of other things that you can check out um, in the library. And also I wanna show you uh, another feature that we have, besides checking out things in our library, we have a service called Interlibrary Loan. We, we call it ILL for short, but Interlibrary Loan means our staff will look for the article or a book. If we don't have it in our library, we will go anywhere in the world and find a library that has it and try to, to get a copy for you. If it's a if it's an article, we will get an electronic copy and you'll, you'll get an email that you can download. If it's a book, we'll try to borrow it and you can have it for, for three or four weeks and maybe longer if needed. Um, but I'm gonna show you uh, another service that we have. So let's go to books. And I have a book that I wanna show you what we can do. So the name of my book is called Make It Stick. This is a book about the science of successful learning. This is a book that we all want to read at the beginning of the semester. So we want to get good grades. So um, notice that in our catalog, we actually have um, print copies and we have an, an e-copy, electronic copy of this book. But I wanted to show you here in Ellis, we have a copy that is not checked out. So I want to show you if you wanted just one chapter from this book, so this book is also available at the law library, but it is on reserve there, meaning that only law students can check out books on reserve at the law library. But our copy here in Ellis is not checked out. So if you look at this and you say, I think I only want chapter seven, which is increase your abilities. I really don't want the rest of the book. If you wanted that, you could request that we copy chapter seven for you. And you do that by clicking on this little request a book. And here you can either request the entire book or just a chapter. And if you want one chapter, our staff, there's a little form you log in, our staff will copy that for you. We won't copy more than one because if you want more than one copy, we'll probably send you the entire book. But we will copy one book for, one chapter of a book for you and send it to you electronically. So that is one of the services that we have. Um, it's called Scan and Deliver. So, um, so the, the thing that I wanted to tell you, and in, and in addition to books, we also have um, CDs, that you, music CDs. We have um, movies on uh, DVDs that you can check out. So they check out for a, a shorter amount of time. But all of these things, 
If you don't want to go into the stacks and find these yourself, you can, you can request up for you by doing what I just showed you, request a book, and our staff will actually go into this in the stacks and pull it for you, and you can check it out. Now, that service takes a little bit longer. It's anywhere from two to four days, depending on what time of day you do it. So it's faster if you go into the stacks and check it out and find it yourself and go to the, the desk. But if you have time and you don't want to do that, our staff will do that for you. So all of those, all of these things are services that we offer to you to help to make your life a little bit easier. So um, I think that's all I'm going to tell you about today. So I'm going to let the next person come up. My name is Kelly Hansen, and I'm from Special Collections, uh, which is in this building up on the fourth floor west. Um, so if you get in the elevator, follow the directions on how to get to fourth floor west, and then go that way, that's where Special Collections is. Um, but I'm going to show you our website just as a way of kind of introducing you to what Special Collections is and what we do and what we uh, can do for you. So if you go under this Libraries uh, tab here, and you click on Special Collections, this takes you to our website. Um, and you can see here a little bit about what we are. Um, we have the things in the library that are very old. So as you can see, the oldest things in the library are 4,000 years old. Um, up to the present day, we have things that have scholarly value um, as a collection and that need some special care in handling. So things in special collections don't check out. Like Cindy was just going over all the different ways you can check most of the things in the building out. Special collections you have to use within uh, our reading room, but we do have, um, you know, procedures for you to do that in place. And, and I want to make sure that you guys know that, you know, it's not to keep you away from this material. This is definitely open to you. It's open to everyone. You're welcome to come in and request anything in the collection that you want. So um, just to learn a little bit more about the collections, you can come to our website here. And we have an overview of our collection strengths. So you can see here, medieval manuscripts and early printing is one strength of our collection. Um, we have manuscripts that go back to the 8th century and then up through the Renaissance. Um, and then the, the very earliest printed books. We also have a leaf from the Gutenberg Bible, um, you know, things like that that need some extra care and handling. But like I said, you're welcome to request any of these things. These are your things. Comic books are uh, an important collection, often popular with students. We have about 13,000 catalog comic books. And I say catalog because at this point we're working through a backlog. Um, dating from, and I need to update this, dating from the 1840s to the present. As we have the very earliest graphic novels from the 1840s in the collection, all the way up to comics that were just recently published this year. Um, literature, religion, and politics is a big chunk of the collection, too. We have about 15,000 pamphlets on various religious and political themes uh, from the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, um, mostly British and American, but also political cartoons, underground publications. If you're interested in communication and journalism, that's a great resource for you, um, as well as the propaganda posters. Um, artist books and fine press imprints are books that are made to be works of art. So books that are kind of made as um, sculptural pieces or as art pieces in themselves. So not necessarily meant to be read for their text, um, but things that are, it, it's kind of difficult to explain what they are, but they're, they're really interesting. And, and this is a really fast growing part of the collection. So um, I would encourage you to come up and take a look. Theater and the performing arts, um, you can see here, and then history of science, uh, those of you who are in the health sciences or the, the life sciences might be interested in this collection area. We've got a lot of different landmarks of scientific thought um, from the 17th century is about when it starts up through the 19th century. And some really, really beautiful illustrated editions of those. And finally, those who are interested in the history of education um, might also be interested in our historic textbook collection which gets a lot of use from people who are education researchers. So I often get a question of how do I know what's in special collections? How do I find this stuff? Um, so there's two ways to do that. 
And one is to go to this page and click on this link, Collections A to, a to Z, which will give you a really long list of all of the finding aids in special collections. So finding aids are what we call kind of a list, like an inventory sort of of a, of a collection. It's not going to tell you exactly what's in the collection. It's just kind of going to tell you where to look. So like a really, really simple finding aid would look like this. Diane Gordonitsky photographs of Lanford Wilson, and it just has an inventory showing you that there's 14 folders of photos that you had to go through and see what they are. Um, or it might be something like this. Cuneiform tablets, which is a really small collection. We only have seven of them, or eight, sorry, eight of them. Um, but you can see that there's actually, they're available online. There's links to each one. And you can find more information about them there. So I think this is the best place to start when you're looking for information about collections. Um, but one other place to look is in the catalog. You can find, let's see, do comics. Oh, it's not here. Oh, that's why it's here. So comic art, we'll go here. Um, this is kind of a listing of all of our collections that deal with comic art. But then if you go here to the catalog, you'll see a listing of all of these 13,000 comic books that I was talking about. So we've got 4,500 almost titles here, right, of, of kind of titles. And then comics are serials, right? They have different issues that come out under the same title. So we have about 13,000 issues that are cataloged. And this is how you can find out and see like what's in the comic collection. And then, like I said, anything that you see in the catalog that you that says special collections, you the process is then you just go upstairs during our open hours and you ask for it, and we'll get it out for you. Okay. So finally, before I hand it off to Felicity, I just want to point out too that we do have a page for digital collections and exhibits, and Felicity will get into much more detail. Um, with how you find digital materials. But this is just kind of our grouping of materials from special collections that have been digitized. So with that, I will hand it over to Felicity. And I'm Felicity Dykus in Digital Services, so I also work in this building. Let me start out by asking you, where, where can you find MU Digital Theses and Dissertations? Anyone know? How about publications of the University of Missouri Extension? And here are some examples from uh, 2018. So you can see there's a whole variety of topics, cash rental rates, alfalfa bailage, article professional insemination in swine, all the way to challenges and choices fit for life. So not only where can you find those, but where can you as a student or a researcher posts data to support a published article. So if you're publishing an article, where are you going to put the data? Or if you give a poster presentation at somewhere, is there a place you can put the poster so you can link to it in the future? Yes, MoSpace. So MoSpace is the place where you can find all those and more. So this was the description in the workshop for the workshop about my part. A place to preserve and access your data, articles, theses, and dissertations in our online repository. So an online repository, it has online material, so digital format, full text, and it's the resources of an organization. And most spaces is a specific type, an institutional repository. So it has um, stuff about MU. And if you've been at other schools, you may see that that universities all over the U.S. have institutional repositories. So our goal is to make available the creative and scholarly works of faculty, students, and staff. And they're going to be freely available on the web in general. And our goal is to preserve them for the future. So you probably search them on the web and you go back two years later and it's gone. Our goal for most space is to make sure it stays available. And then here's examples from other schools. So it just fits into this whole scholarly network where all, all, all universities are making our resources available to people. So let me go back to some of these again. Are any of you in theses or dissertation programs? Will you be writing one? 
Okay. So your thesis or dissertation will be in those states. And we work with gradu the graduate school to make those available. So they'll get all the paperwork from you and send it to us and then we'll add it. So there's usually like a four or five month lag time for them to get that paperwork. So when you do that, you have the choice whether you're gonna restrict it to the campus or make it open. But if you do make it open, we do have people from all over the world who access the content. So when you go to most space, the easiest way to find these is to look at the menu options for theses, departments, advisors, semesters, and you can track down the ones already in there. So you can see what people in your department have done in the past. So we also get data sets. So now if, uh, if you're publishing uh, research articles, a lot of publishers want to know where the data is. So most base is one option to put the data. Oh, Wrong example. This is a poster. <laughs> so if you do, and a lot of our students do make poster presentations at conferences. So when you come back, you can submit it to MoSpace and we'll make it available. Now for that data example. So if you have a research <coughs> article and you want to put the supporting data somewhere, so MoSpace is an option for that. And this is another example from a published article. And here's presentation slides, not just posters, but you could do presentation slides and put them in those space. So those were examples of things our researchers, our students and faculty do. But we also make available MU material. So we work with Extension, the Agriculture Experiment Stations over at the Medical School, the Families Physician Inquiries Network. We have alumni association magazines, yearbooks, maps, so we're making those available too. So most space is about MU stuff, whether it's created by our students or departments. So to get more information, or if you do want to submit something, the top menu bar includes an option to submit works. There's also, I just want to point out the contact us where you can get more information on that. Kelly mentioned another piece of what we do in digital services, and that's we digitize items. So we're working with the special collections staff and the subject specialist that Joe mentioned to identify things in our collection that would be useful for, for people on campus. And on the special collections page, you'll see a list of some of the things we've done, including the pamphlets she talked about, some, some of the comic strips. So we have, uh, high class, uh, high quality scanners that we use. So we try to get the best quality possible. Then we scan it and we either put it in our digital library or the high trust. And again, our goal there is to make it widely available. As an example, we had, there was a researcher at uh, Princeton who was interested, was trying to get funds to come here and do something in, in our collections. Her funding fell through, but it was from the 1880s, so we were able to digitize it and put it online. So now she could access it, but then other people all over the world can access it. And so it's really great for the unique materials we have to make them more widely available. So, so again, our, our goal is to take research presentation material that you might create, ME publications, put it in those space, make it available, open access, and for long-term preservation. And then to digitize material in our collection and to make those also open and to give preservation. <coughs> and so we'll come to the next person ready. Back to Crow, I guess. Thank you, Joe. Um, from our, I'm Marie Kincannon, the head of government information and data archives at our library. And um, from our homepage, to get to the government information or government documents section, you just go under libraries and then government documents. So we've got about 39 or 40 pages of information about government information. And um, we get over a million hits to our website every year just the government information stuff. Um, what 
What course, what um, fields are you guys in? It helps me to talk about things that are relevant to you. Does anybody want to say what you're studying? International business, okay. Public policy. Public policy, okay. Anybody else care to say what they're studying? You don't have to. Yeah, special education. Oh, special education, okay. All right, well, public policy, that's an obvious connection. You're studying what does the government do? What do they think about any particular topic? So, yeah, we're all over that. Um, and then international business. Certainly, the United States government is very interested in anything that regards our relationships with other countries. So we're also all over that. Um, education, well, at first, you might just think about classrooms and you know processes of teaching. But think about it, the government is all over that too, because there are public schools, and there's federal agencies for education and state agencies for education. And what other, whatever other topics you might be studying, if you think about it for a second, the government is probably involved in it. Um, maybe they establish regulations that say how you have to conduct yourself when you're professional in that field. Or maybe there's federal funding that supports your field. And by the way, am I still being heard okay? I really think I'm not staying here. Okay. Um, there might be federal funding that supports your field largely if you're anything, doing anything in the sciences. Federal grants are huge, so that's major. Um, and history. Uh, Actually, that, that would probably be the first thing that I would say if you ask me if, you know, what's, what fields are interested in government information. The very first one I would say would be in history because we, we, have, we are a federal depository library. That means that we get everything that the federal government prints up and makes available. And we've been part of this program, the Federal Depository Library Program, since 1862. So we've, for most of that time, we've gotten everything that they have. I mean, you might wonder where it all is. We have some huge offsite storage facilities that contain a lot of government documents that we've received over that time. And then some of it we have in this building. But uh, it's actually in the branches too. It has to do with a particular topic. We've got a lot over in the engineering library. Think of the scientific agencies that do with engineering and Missouri Department of Transportation, building roads, you know, that's all there. All the way back to the beginning of those organizations that built roads. So you can see the original decision making about why they decided to build a road in a certain place. Environmental history. If you wanted to know what was in this place before this building was here, you know, we've gotten questions about Civil War battlefields. You know, um, they wanted to know where the trees were. Yeah, it's kind of an interesting question. Where exactly were the trees? Um, all kinds of questions come into government information. So although at first glance, you think government documents, oh my gosh, that sounds so boring. Actually, it may have a lot to do with your professional life after you graduate. So um, to help prepare you, we have a government information department in our library. Part of the reason why we have librarians dedicated to this is it can be very hard to find documents on the topic that you need. For example, Suppose you were studying uh, the start of the Lake of the Ozarks, so we've got that big recreational lake down there, with water skiing and all the fun stuff you could do. What if you wanted to study, well, you know, how did that come about? I want to see what government information there is about this Lake of the Ozarks coming about. Well, one of the first things you have to do is figure out what government agencies would have been interested in that. So it could have been Missouri Department of Tourism would be one. And there is a big electrical dam there, so it could be the U.S. Department of Energy, that could be one. Um, there could be, well, wildlife would be affected once you start decide to flood things. And so, and you've got the Department of Conservation involved. And so there's so many of these organi government organizations and agencies that could have a hand in it. But if you don't already know what those agencies are, it could be very difficult. Because if you can't go into Merlin and type in Lake of the Ozarks and have everything instantly pop up, which I guarantee you it will not, then you've got to figure out, well, how am I going to find this government information? And so that's where you ask the librarians, or you look at our website, that's getting lots of hits. Um, or you can try to meddle through on your own. What I don't recommend is going to Google. And that's what everybody does the first thing, don't they? If you were to type in history of the Lake of the Ozarks, you might get a Wikipedia page authored by, who knows, you know, maybe my, my 10 year old nephew. I mean, I don't know who wrote that stuff, right? <laughs> um, sometimes people write who have a reason, who have some knowledge about it, but sometimes not. 
But you know, why go to Google and look at Wikipedia when you're um, paying good tuition money to this university campus for all the resources that we have to offer you? So as long as you have paid your money to be here, take advantage of what this university has to offer. And we have so much more than Wikipedia. So whatever it is you're studying, I just encourage you to think, is there any government connection with this thing I want to write a paper about? And feel free to contact us. Let me see if there's anything else. I First of all, any questions? Questions? OK. Um, statistics is one of the most popular things that people come to government information to look for. So they use government documents to find statistics, because governments collect statistics probably better than other organizations do. So that's uh, always a big draw. Um, and speaking of statistics, uh, we also have data services. Felicity touched on it. She talked about if you will be gathering data as part of your graduate studies, and you have a data set that you use to discover, that you use to uh, you look at, and you discover new things from that data set, and then you provide it to her so that she can put it up on the, on the, the most space website and allow other people to use your data. We, as the University Library, subscribe to two additional data archive organizations. We pay money fees, so it's not free internet. But because you are university, university students, you have privileges to go into these two data archives and see all the data that other people have searched for, not just, not just anybody, data or professional data organizations have gone in, searched for it, put it together in an archive and made it searchable. So you can, if you've got a research question, like, okay, I'm gonna come up something out of my head. Uh, research question, do more Democrats or more Republicans report being happy? Who's happier? Okay, I just, I just made that up on the spot. You'd have to find a data set where they, somebody, that there's a questionnaire that asks people, how happy would you say you are on a scale of one to 10, say? And then a, and another question on that same survey would have to say, are you Democrat or Republican? Boom, now you, now you can say, now you can say, well, conclusively, according to this um, sample of 1,000 randomly sampled people, or however many that data set happened to have, I have discovered that either Republicans or Democrats say they are happier. Now, I think that that would be news. I just thought it up like that, you know. Maybe you can think up some research question that has to do with your own field. Something that would seem like an obvious question that a lot of people would wonder about. And surely, might there be a data set already available that you don't have to find a thousand randomly sampled people yourself and to convince them to sit down and take a survey? There are so many surveys that have already been done and all the data is available to you through the university library. Now, um, that website is, well, it's, it's part of our library. I like to go to libraries A to Z. What have happened here? Oh, here we are. Down to D for data. And it's data sets for quantitative research. <coughs> and the two archives that we've subscribed to, one is called ICPSR, that stands for Inter-University Consortium for Political and Social Research. And that's where you will find all the, the old data sets that were collected from, uh, say, news organizations that did telephone polls and they asked people questions over the phone, like ABC News and NBC News and all those ones. Um, maybe they ask questions before an election takes place. And they say, who are you going to vote for? And by the way, how old are you? And how much money do you have in your household? And you know, all these other questions. Well, after the election is over, they absolutely don't care. They don't need that anymore. They already wrote their article on it. But later on, maybe an academic, academic researcher would be intensely interested to know, you know, what were people saying in 1972 before that election? And how did that compare to 1976? And how did women in particular vote or respond differently to these kinds of questions? from 1972 to 2015. Well, there you've got something really interesting because you got something over time and that's all possible too. In fact, the, the level of, of uh, opportunity you have to discover new information 
using nothing more than data that's already been collected and is already available to use through our library website has never been bigger. Your opportunities have never been bigger than right now. You can make those discoveries and you be the author of some article that eventually makes it into Google News and that, you know, tens of thousands of people click on in the first day. I mean, why not? It's so easy. Um, I've seen articles about topics that are very simple, you know, but nobody had actually proved it yet. Like um, one that I saw was uh, um, the connection between um, teenagers and obesity was one. Okay, so it was a front page article in a major newspaper and it said, uh, studies show that teenagers are now more obese than they have been in the past. They had a study, they figured it out. Here's the conclusive proof. Whereas before that, nobody had ever actually proved it. They had, hadn't, hadn't proved it. And then this study proved it. And it didn't come out all that long ago. So even the things that we assume are true, we don't really know until someone's proved it. And we all have assumptions. We all have ideas about the way the world works, you know, but we're really just assuming. Think about it. How many things that you know have you just assumed? And how many things, how many of those things have been proved? And that's where data comes in. Data is the future, and the library has not only books, but we have data too. So think about the, op the op options and opportunities that are open to you in your particular study and the things that you want to accomplish by the time you graduate. Because you can use these things as a stepping stone, stepping stone to the next phase of your professional life. Any questions? All right, thank you. All right, so that pretty much wraps up our set of presentations for today, but we did want to give you time if there were any questions about uh, either resources or services uh, that were uh, that we have here that might help you with your own research um, or uh, your areas of interest. So if there are any questions, feel free to ask. Again, we have uh, materials in the back that you can pick up on. Uh, uh, we've got some pamphlets for well, that's for services for graduate professional students, but if you're an undergrad, feel free to pick that up as well because if you're going to be conducting research, uh, so that information will help you. If you're faculty or if you're going to be working with faculty or if you're going to be doing any teaching, there's a pamphlet back there for you as well. Um, you were able to register for this workshop, so if you haven't already, feel free to go back to that workshops page at any point uh, and take a look at some of the other things that we have offered. We've got a workshop um, uh, three other workshop titles that we're offering basically through the rest of, of September or well into September. We have one on choosing a citation manager. So if you've ever used or have wanted to use or been curious about using a program like Zotero or EndNote or Mendeley, uh, we have a, an hour long workshop in which a couple of our librarians go through uh, and discuss what these all do, uh, what the relative strengths and weaknesses are of those three programs, which disciplines tend to gravitate towards which program. And then if you, at the end of that, decide, you know, maybe you want to learn more about EndNote or about Zotero or about Mendeley, then we do have additional one hour sessions that we have scheduled that will focus just on those individual programs. So you can come in and you can learn how to get Zotero installed, how to get it configured so that it works with our resources and so on. So we've got those coming up. We have a workshop coming up uh, this week and the next two weeks. Uh, called Demystifying the Literature Review. So if you are going to be needing to write a lit review for any reason here in the near future, especially for those of you that are new grad students, we will be offering that. That's uh, taught by Kimberly Moeller, who's one of our librarians, but also it's being co-taught by uh, Dr. Christy, Gold Christy Goldsmith from the Campus Writing Program. So uh, that was very well attended last week. So feel free to uh, sign up for that as well. Uh, finally, the last one that we have is uh, a workshop that's called Badging Your Research Identity uh, and Impact. Something like that. And, um, and that's going to allow you to set up uh, what's called an ORC ID, set up your Google Scholar profile, uh, goes over things like uh, citation metrics, um, research impact factor, alt metrics, things like that. Things that you would need to know if you are going to be conducting research and publishing a lot so that you can make sure that your name uh, and your identity is properly attached to these things, to these documents 
uh, as they go out into the world, and then also how, as a scholar, if you uh, if you need to track how the effect or impact uh, of the work that you are uh, are generating, how many times people are citing it and using it and referencing it, that you'll be able to figure that out and understand how all that works. So we've got all those coming up. Um, the main thing that I think that we'd like to stress here at the end is that uh, uh, just not to be a stranger. So we have a reference desk here on the main floor that you can come to at any time while it's uh, during the day and into the early evening hours. Typically, you'll be able to come there and talk to a librarian or uh, one of our staff that's been trained to work on the desk and we can help you with your research. It might be something that depending on your research need, we might have to call somebody out uh, a librarian out to uh, to be able to work with you if it's uh, if there's a specific you know a subject uh, uh, specialty that we need that we can bring somebody out. But feel free to to talk to us that way. You can always use the Ask the Librarians chat to uh, to talk with us. Uh, if you can't make it to the library or just don't feel like coming in and sitting down across from us, you can always use that chat function to ask us questions in real time. And then don't forget about finding. Uh, looking up your subject librarian, that person uh, will be your best friend as you go through the process of conducting research. And so that, the more that you can get to know that person, feel comfortable contacting with uh, that librarian, the better off you'll be. So any questions before we go? Anything from, let me check the chat here, anything from our chat? All right. So with that said, I would say thank you. Thank you for attending. If you didn't sign in the sign in sheet, please do before you go and uh, grab some stuff from the back if you'd like. Thank you.